<laughs> right, let's settle down. <laughs> I have uh, quite long-standing connections with the Mennonite community who are a very peaceful, peace-loving community and they taught me a way of getting a crowd to be quiet which is just put your hand up and if you see a hand raised you put your hand up and eventually everybody's putting their hand up and it quietens people down so maybe we'll practice that next week. I, I want to push on because I think it's important that we honour a kind of closing time in these lectures otherwise it'll become a real burden for you to turn up so uh, let's aim for me to be finished by nine so that you can get home and have your cocoa. Um, <laughs> so uh, let's start the second lecture then. So what I'm doing is trying to identify some of the fundamental Jewish theological convictions that united the whole Jewish community that Jesus would have shared and that early Christianity had to, in a sense, begin to rethink in light of its experience of, of, uh, of Christ. Talked about the notion of one God, and secondly the notion of one people that this one God has called into special relationship with this larger saving purpose in view. The third part of the picture is the, is the gift of the law, the gift of the Torah, which, if you like, spelled out the conditions of Israel's covenant relationship to God. Israel was in the sense of unique relationship to God, but what that relationship meant in practice was spelled out in the details of the Torah, in the law given to Moses on Mount Sinai, which uh, we have recorded in the first five books of the Old Testament, which specifies what Israel must do in order to be faithful to its relationship with God. Now, it really is impossible to exaggerate the importance of the law for the Judaism of Jesus' day. The law or the Torah represented, if you like, the collective constitution or the national flag of this particular people, the supreme symbol of and the, and the fundamental basis of her sense of unique identity. No other people in antiquity venerated their sacred texts in the same way that the Jews did. They believed that in their sacred written texts, in the Torah, they could find the eternal wisdom of God. I read an article a few months ago by a Jewish uh, scholar who suggested that in Judaism, the law is for Jews what the incarnation is for Christians. That the law is the crystallization. The law is actually the incarnation of the word of God for Jews in the way that Christ is the incarnation of God for Christians. It's a mark of, of this attitude to the law that we find right back uh, at this period as well. Therefore, Jewish scholars studied the law in minute detail to discern what it was God actually expected of his people if she was to be faithful to her relationship with him. And they calculated that in addition to the Ten Commandments, the Torah consisted of 613 particular requirements, 365 that were negative things you should not do, and 248 that are positive affirmations, things that you should do. Of course, God must have intended that every one of these requirements was obeyed. But having a written law and, and ascribing to it that transcendent significance inevitably raised two questions that were in constant need of discussion and ongoing reflection. One was the question of definition. What do the specific commandments actually mean? How are the terms that they use to be defined? For example, the Torah forbids working on the Sabbath day. We all know that. Keep the Sabbath day holy. Even your slaves and your livestock must rest on the Sabbath day. But what constitutes work? If you're not supposed to work on the Sabbath, then surely you must know what actually constitutes work. It's interesting, I've just written a book on the, uh, largely on the parable of the Good Samaritan, and you find a similar kind of thing going on there where Jesus enters into this discussion with a Jewish lawyer, and they both agree that you should love your neighbours yourself, but then the lawyer says, but who is my neighbour? You know, define your terms. We need to know what these terms mean if we are going to obey them. 
it was eventually decided that there were 39 activities that were prohibited on the Sabbath if you were to honour this word from God not to work on the Sabbath, which included sowing and ploughing and reaping and harvesting and threshing and winnowing and grinding and sorting and sifting and baking and so on. But then each of these categories also requires defining. Is frying an egg on a hot rock, for example, cooking? If it is, then you have worked. And if you have worked, you have not honoured the law. Is salting vegetables in preparation for cooking work? I mean, this we, 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 we perhaps laugh at this, but I can remember my grandmother, who was a good Baptist, would peel the spuds for Sunday lunch on Saturday so that they wouldn't have to be done on Sunday. So it's a similar kind of, uh, of, of thinking going on. What about if you're locked in a war? Are you permitted to fight on the Sabbath day? Surely fighting must constitute work. Now, interestingly, uh, in time, most Jewish jurists concluded that it was OK to fight on the Sabbath day as long as it was in self-defence but not to engage in aggressive campaigns. Again, we smile, but there are stories from our own history uh, during the land wars of Maoris believing that the settlers would take Sunday seriously and not attack them on Sunday. But surprise, surprise, they did. So this kind of mindset is not unique to, to Jewish uh, thinking at all, but it's very, very uh, pronounced in Jewish thought because of this profound commitment to obey what the law of God requires. Or again, the Torah instructs Israelites to dwell in booths on the Feast of Tabernacles. Question, well, what is a booth? What constitutes a booth? Or the Torah says to stay away from all things that are unclean, but are all things equally unclean? Or are there degrees of uncleanness? Or the Torah requires farmers to leave a corner of their fields unreaped so that the harvest, so that the poor can go and harvest them for themselves. It's actually a tremendous social justice stipulation in the law uh, that the poor, even on the Sabbath, were allowed to go and, uh, and harvest the corners of other people's fields in order to eat. Question, how big should the corner be? <laughs> you know, is a tiny little bit enough? Or should it be a reasonable chunk of land? The Mishnah eventually said that it must be not one sixtieth, no smaller than one sixtieth of the harvest. So the law constantly raises questions of definition. And once again, we find Jesus uh, criticised by his opponents for being a bit too slack about Sabbath observance and not taking ritual clean, cleanliness seriously enough, not washing his hands. His disciples didn't wash before they ate, not in a high, as a hygiene matter, but as a ritual matter. So questions of definition were constantly raised by this uh, commitment to the Torah as the, as the essence of the relationship. And then, of course, there's the question of application. How are these legal requirements to be practically applied in the changing circumstances of everyday life and in changing historical periods. How, for example, does one keep the laws of sacrifice or secure ritual purification if you live thousands of miles from the temple and from the priests? Or what happens when two laws, like keeping the Sabbath day holy and preserving human life, what happens when they come into conflict with each other? Again, we find this in the Gospels. Jesus says if, a, if your animal falls into the ditch on the Sabbath, you would surely pull it out if it's going to die. Why then is it wrong for me to heal? Well, what happens if you, are in, if you have the, the, the commandment to obey your parents, which is part of the Ten Commandments, really important, but your parents ask you to do something illegal? Do you obey your parents and break the law? Or do you not obey your parents and break the law in order not to break the law. Again, this is something not unique at all. This is something that lawyers continue to, uh, and human rights um, canons continue to have to wrestle. What happens when two rights come into conflict with each other? Well, how does one avoid accidentally transgressing the law? Or is it enough to sort of minimally conform to the law, or should one go even further than the law requires? Tithing, for example. Should one tithe one's purchases as well as one's productions? 
You have to tithe what you produce. Well, should the godly actually go one step further and tithe what they purchase? <coughs> Jesus uh, talks about how the Pharisees even tithed garden herbs in their devotion to these laws. So these two questions constantly faced uh, Jewish scholars and rabbis at the time of Jesus. And, and again, we find these, these issues coming up in the gospel narratives. But they both come down to this one basic question. How is the law to be properly interpreted? What hermeneutical principles, what principles of interpretation apply? And Jewish education was largely devoted to such questions. And over time, an elaborate set of, of oral case laws grew up, the intention of which was to build a fence around the law to prevent accidental infringement of the law. And in time, this oral case law, this, this, this tradition of oral interpretation of the law, came to assume, quite understandably, as much authority as the written law itself. Because after all, the case law, the oral law, actually was an interpretation of the written law. And in time uh, subsequent to the New Testament, the, the, the idea emerged that on Mount Sinai, God gave to Moses both the written law and the oral law. So they went right back to the beginning. Now, that idea wasn't current at the time of Jesus, but we do find Jesus uh, criticizing his contemporaries for the way in which they honored what he calls the tradition of the elders more than the written law that they honored the tradition of the elders as a way actually of evading the hard demands of the law. Now the single greatest block of Mosaic law, oh, sorry, to press the buttons, the single greatest uh, block of Mosaic law, single greatest block of the, of the Pentateuch, Pentateuchal law, concerns ritual purity. This distinction between clean and unclean, something that we modern Protestants find incredibly hard to understand. But it's, it's, it's absolutely fundamental to the Jewish worldview of the time and, and indeed to, to many other cultures today. Much of the ritual purity law in the Old Testament relates to what priests do or don't do and, and to, the, to, the, to the regulations surrounding temple worship. But by Jesus' day, these priestly purity categories had become, by, by certain really committed people such as the Pharisees, had been extended to non-priestly people, to the non-priestly classes. Groups like the Pharisees formed special fellowships that were devoted to upholding the ritual regulations of the law, especially at mealtimes, with particular sharpness. In fact, the word Pharisee may derive from the idea of, 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 of sharpness, of being really sharp in your interpretation of the details of the law. And the Pharisees, of course, crop up over and over again uh, in the Gospel narratives. Other groups like the Essenes withdrew into monastic communities in the desert and denounced the mainstream Jewish community as corrupt and impure and godless. The Dead Sea Scrolls come from uh, such a community in the Dead Sea area. Priestly groups like the Sadducees continued to invest enormous energies in the temple and in sacrifice. That was their power base. As we will see, Jesus and his disciples were often sharply criticized for their comparatively lax attitudes towards purity laws including, according to Mark's Gospel, and chapter, uh, chapter 7 of Mark's Gospel, even including food laws, although it's a bit ambiguous uh, what is meant there. But Mark slips in this comment, thus he declared all foods clean. And Mark is probably saying, in Jesus' attitude towards ritual purity, there was a principle that eventually justified the early Christians in abandoning the distinction between clean and unclean foods. Whether Jesus did himself, I think, is much, much more doubtful. One final comment. If the first major, on this point, if the first major gain of recent scholarship is recovery of Jesus the Jew, and if the second is a recognition of the diversity of Judaism, that Jesus fits in a very diverse tapestry, then the third major gain of recent scholarship is the abandonment, at least by scholars, it still hasn't happened in the church, but at least by New Testament scholars, that the, the abandonment of the old caricature of Judaism as a legalistic religion that taught salvation by works, which is a very Protestant way of thinking about it. That the, the, you know, the, the, the kind of way that modern scholars are saying is that, is that sort of uh, Luther imagined that the Jews were a bit like medieval Catholics. And he sort of took all his objection to medieval Catholicism and projected it back onto first century Judaism. And the church 
and Christian readers have often done the same. Certainly, law keeping was enormously important for first century Jews. Certainly it is an issue that comes up in the ministry of Jesus time and again, and certainly it is an issue that is absolutely dominant in the first generation of the church. It's the issue that Paul struggles with more than any other. But this emphasis on law keeping was probably not understood as a means of earning one's salvation or of gaining merit with God, but rather was an expression of gratitude for and obedience to the covenant relationship. The covenant, just read Deuteronomy, it's clear as day. The covenant is a gift of grace. Deuteronomy says, I haven't chosen you because you're the best nation in the world. I haven't chosen you because you deserve it. I've chosen you as an act of sovereign mercy and grace. The covenant is a gift of grace. The law is how one responds to grace through gratitude and, and obedience. Now, of course, any text-based religion, including Presbyterianism, any text-based religion is vulnerable to externalism and formalism. We're all vulnerable to that, to just conforming to the sort of external details of what other people expect of us. And any text-based religion can, it's possible to, to um, fall into self-righteousness and into fundamentalism. Again, Christians know this better than most. But the ideal in Judaism and the ideal in Christianity is not salvation by works, but salvation is an act of gratitude. Uh, obedience is an act of gratitude to salvation that comes by God's pure grace. One God, one people, one law, and one land. A fourth fundamental feature of the Jewish worldview is the notion of sacred turf broken down into an understanding of, of, of the gift of the land, the importance of Jerusalem as the city of, 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 of God, and the temple as the heart of the city. God's covenant promises to Abraham and to his descendants included, I'm tempted to say sadly, because we are still living with the legacy of this particular promise, it included the promise of land. Specifically, the land of Canaan, or what today we know as Israel or Palestine. This promise, Jews believed, was fulfilled in the exodus from Egypt under Moses and the conquest of Canaan by Joshua. So a fundamental axiom of Jewish identity was the belief that certain territory had been gifted in perpetuity to Israel by God. God had given Israel this particular piece of real estate. Sad for those who are already dwelling upon it, but God had given it to Israel. The problem was, at the time of Jesus, and for centuries before, and indeed for centuries afterwards, the Jewish people no longer controlled the land. It was under pagan rule. Clearly, something was wrong. Clearly, something had to be done to put it right. But why had things gone so wrong? Why were Jews captives in their own land? And what was the best way <coughs> to actually rectify it? On this question, as on almost every other question, opinions differed. Once heard a philosopher say that people ask him all the time, you're a philosopher, what's your philosophy? And his philosophy is things are more complicated than they seem. <laughs> so uh, opinions always differ on important matters. Opinions differ on this issue. Many, it appears, saw Israel's dispossession of the land as a punishment for her sin, for her failure to keep the covenant, to keep the law as she was supposed to. Some saw the answer to this in armed rebellion. For militants in the first century, for people who we often call these days zealots, Israel's greatest sin was the fact that she acknowledged the rule of Caesar and paid tribute to him 
in contradiction to the Ten Commandments that said you should have no other gods before me. And the solution was to resist Caesar, to rise up in armed rebellion, believing that once Israel did, God would come to her rescue. And it appears that during the first century and at the time of Jesus, armed resistance, armed activism, what today we would call religious terrorism, if you like, was bubbling beneath the surface. The Jews were a very troublesome people for the Romans to control. And their inclination towards rebellion was always there, and there were times in which it occurred. Others saw the solution lying in greater piety on the part of uh, God's people, a more stringent commitment to purity, that if Israel but kept the law properly for one day, then God would come to her rescue. So we had activists and we had the pietists. And then there are others who thought, well, we've got to make the best of what we've got. It's probably God's will. After all, God controls everything. If Rome's here, God wants Rome to be here. And what we need to do is collaborate with Rome. The Sadducees who controlled the temple establishment largely collaborated with the rule of Rome. The kingdom of God was what was in existence now under their control. But it appears that for most Palestinian Jews, the eventual liberation of Israel from pagan control, from the control of the Romans, and the restoration of the land to her was a widely cherished dream. Fifthly, a fifth feature of Israel's sense of identity was this awareness of being set apart from all other peoples. As a result of election and covenant and the gift, the promise at least, of the land, the Jews had this powerful sense of being different, of being distinctive, or to use the biblical word of being holy, being set apart from all that is unclean and idolatrous. So maintaining this set-apartness was a basic concern of Jewish legal interpretation. It was especially important in the diaspora, where Jewish communities were surrounded by, uh, by, by paganism. And in this commitment to maintaining the sense of distinction, which the law called Israel to be different, that in the interest of certain particular requirements of the Torah assumed huge significance in symbolizing Israel's distinction or election. Now, Israel had felt she had to obey the whole law, but there were certain features of the law that were especially important as sort of boundary markers uh, for the covenant people, the sort of litmus test for fidelity to the law. And perhaps the most important of these were things like circumcision. This was required of Abraham as a sign of entering into the covenant. All Jewish males are circumcised on the eighth day, including Jesus, uh, according to the Gospel of Luke. Jesus never questioned the role of circumcision. Have you ever noticed that? Circumcision never comes up as an issue in the Gospels. But in the next generation, in the time of Paul and the first uh, Christians, just a few years later, it became the defining issue, or one of the defining issues, that led to this parting of the ways. It's really interesting that this issue dominates the New Testament. When's the last time you heard a sermon on circumcision? <laughs> When's the last time church is divided over the issue of circumcision? It's just not one of our problems anymore. But in the, in the first generation church, it was the kind of issue that homosexuality is in our generation. It was a really critical, uh, critical matter. Sabbath observance. Ceasing all activities that resemble work on the seventh day, required in the Decalogue, according to the creation story modelled by God himself, who rests on the Sabbath day. Jesus was considered much too lax in his Sabbath behaviour. Not that he completely ignored Sabbath regulations, but he was, in the view of his critics, was far too liberal about Sabbath observance. Ritual purity laws, especially laws relating to dietary matters. If you uh, have a Bible with the Apocrypha in it and you're bored on Sunday listening to one of Alistair's sermons, uh, read, read the book of Maccabees. It's uh, stories, war, uh, war hero stories from the time of the Maccabean Rebellion, uh, two centuries before the time of Jesus. It tells stories of Jews enduring horrific torture 
and, and fiendish ways of being boiled alive and so on uh, as a form of execution rather than break kosher food laws. It was really, really important. This was a litmus test of fidelity to God. Of course, the corollary of having very strict food laws was a reluctance to share table with Gentiles. It was all right to invite Gentiles to your table, but not to go to their table, because who knows where the food had been before they served it up. Again, this is an issue that we encounter in the New Testament epistles, the book of Corinthians, for example, this, this, or, the, or, or in the book of Acts, the, the, the vision that Peter had of all these creepy quarries coming down on a tablecloth and a voice saying, you know, rise, kill and eat, and poor Peter wants to vomit in the corner because he says, I have never eaten anything unclean in all my life, and now you're telling me to eat what is unclean. Again, these food laws were, were so important because they, 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 they crystallised the sense of commitment to the law of God. Feasts and festivals, like Passover and Pentecost and the Day of Atonement and Tabernacles and Hanukkah and Purim and so on. Worship and prayer, daily prayers in, pay, in, in private and in public. Uh, daily and weekly synagogue services, regular temple sacrifices, again, symbols of distinction and ethnic separatism. Mixed marriages were frowned upon. Uh, in fact, it's been suggested that one of the important functions of circumcision in the diaspora was to identify with whom Jewish women could marry and have intercourse to make sure that, uh, that, that it was a Jew and not a Gentile. Again, this question of the need to maintain symbols of distinction we don't encounter in the Gospel narratives, but we do encounter it in the rest of the New Testament uh, as the Jesus movement started to have to think through these things uh, in a fresh way. The final thing I want to comment on as a, a key ingredient of the Jewish worldview was this, and perhaps this is the most important of all for understanding the Jesus story, it was this powerful and pervasive sense of eschatological expectation, where eschatology just refers to one's hopes for the future, especially for the ultimate future. This powerful belief that the covenant God would act in the near future to bring his redemptive purposes to pass in history, that an age to come would supplant this present evil age, that, to use the language of Jesus, the kingdom of God would come and finally sort out what was wrong in God's domain. This strong future-looking orientation of the Jewish community, which appears to have been very intense at the time of Jesus. How do we know that? Think of the response to John the Baptist when he's out in the wilderness talking about how the day of judgment is right at hand. People were flocking out to hear him. It's one of the many senses we have that there was a, a, a powerful sense of expectancy that God was going to soon act on behalf of his people. It stemmed from two fundamental convictions. One was Israel's belief in the goodness of creation and the faithfulness of God. God, according to the creation narratives, has made the world to be very good. Not just good, but very good. But something has gone terribly wrong in God's creation. Sin and death and idolatry have invaded and corrupted the goodness of creation. But the creator God is inherently loving and unfailingly faithful and therefore has not and will not abandon the world to its condition, but will one day act to redeem the world from its present need. In fact, has already acted to redeem the world from its present need by the choice of Israel and the gift of the Lord. Now, Israel has fallen into problems as well, but this faithful God who has already acted in this redeeming way by choosing Israel will act again to sort out Israel's problems and bring his purposes to completion. The work of recovery is not yet complete, however. Idolatry and death and sin are still present. Final redemption is yet to come. The other thing that contributed to this powerful sense of eschatological expectation was Israel's own paradoxical situation. We are the chosen people. We have been promised by the unfailingly faithful God possession of our own land. But here we are languishing under the heel of pagan Rome and have done so for the last 400 years. 
But God has promised to rescue Israel from her enemies if she remains true to the covenant. Israel is in dire need of rescue. God is unfailingly faithful. Rescue must therefore surely soon be at hand. But how will God rescue his people? How will God's intervention occur? What will hasten its coming? Once again, things are more complicated than you think. There are a variety of opinions on this matter. But there appears to have been a very strong and popular expectation that God would act on behalf of his people by sending the Messiah, who would be an ideal Jewish king from the house of David and the tribe of Judah, a powerful warrior prince, who God would use to cast off the foreign yoke, to restore the land of Israel to his people, to glorify the temple, and to establish God's perfect rule on earth. And not every Jew was a messianic expector, a messianic Jew. Not every, much of the literature we have doesn't even speak about a Messiah, but some does. But even the stuff that does understands the Messiah as a means to the end. The end is the restoration of Israel, the defeat of paganism, the resurrection of the dead, and the healing of creation. That's the goal towards which we are moving. The Messiah is God's instrument for bringing this to pass. Now, once again, the story of Jesus dovetails with this expectation because, according to Jesus, this event of divine rescue is now occurring. It's here. The kingdom of God has arrived but in a rather lacklustre kind of way, in a rather unexpected kind of way, certainly in a surprising kind of way. So uh, that's, if you like, a thumbnail sketch of the, of the religious worldview that, that, that Jesus belonged to, shared, and that the gospel story uh, interacts with. Let me more briefly now just paint in something of the political and cultural context of the Jesus story, which is the context of Roman imperial control. And I'll do this much more briefly. I said in the last lecture, the last hour, that Jesus was, above all else, a religious figure. Now, I sort of, I don't really like the word religious very much because it means so many different things to different people. But he was a religious figure in the sense that he held religious convictions. He held convictions about God and about what God was doing. And I've just sketched in the religious features of early Judaism. But in the same breath, it is important to stress that Jesus was equally a political figure who used political categories like kingdom of God. He used political categories to depict his message and who most importantly, suffered a political death at the hands of the political authorities. Religion and politics in the ancient world generally, and in Judaism especially, were not mutually exclusive categories. They were two sides of the same coin. They belonged intimately together. They were inseparable. It was the priests who exercised political leadership, especially in Judea. Judea was a temple state. Political power was exercised by the priests through the temple establishment. The political rulers, of course, needed religious sanction in order to rule. And so Jesus it was simultaneously a religious figure and a political figure, because in his engagement with the religious leaders, he was not symbolic, but simultaneously engaging with the political leaders as well. You see, we cannot really explain the crucifixion of Jesus without realising that he was perceived to be a threat to the ruling political establishment. Jesus scholars have come up with all kinds of criteria for assessing what they think is the historically most reliable material in the gospel, or at least the material that we can be most confident is historically reliable. And they've come up with, with you know, dozens of criteria for doing so. The one that I think is most interesting is the criterion of crucifiability. 
the criterion of crucifiability, and it simply goes like this. Any explanation for the significance of Jesus that does not explain why he ended up getting crucified is likely to be historically implausible. Any explanation for Jesus that does not explain why he ended up getting crucified, dying a political death at the hands of the political rulers, if we can't explain that, then we probably haven't really explained Jesus at all. The criterion of crucifiability. Now, of course, we might, from a Christian perspective, say, well, he got crucified because God was intending to work the salvation of the world through his death and resurrection. He was crucified for our sins. And, of course, I agree with that, and that is true. But that is looking at the event, if you like, from God's side of the picture. When Pilate arranged to have Jesus crucified, he didn't do it in order to save the world from its sins. <laughs> that wasn't Pilate's intention. He crucified Jesus for purely political reasons, because he perceived Jesus to be, uh, whether Jesus intended to be or not, and Pilate, Pilate wasn't sure about that, but he certainly perceived Jesus to be a political problem. He was causing unrest. He had to be got rid of just in order to to uh, quieten down his opponents. At the time of Jesus, of course, Palestine was part of the huge Roman Empire, been incorporated during the first century of the first, uh, first century BC, uh, BCE, first century before the Common Era. Uh, Judea had been incorporated into the Roman Empire. Rome typically exercised its uh, power through the principle of indirect rule. In other words, rather than deposing local, the local ruling class and replacing them with Roman um, generals and politicians, what they did was they made it worth their while for the local rulers to cooperate with Rome. They, if you like, purchased the loyalty of the local aristocracy by conferring upon them certain privileges they came from cooperating uh, with the Roman overlord. Things like Roman citizenship and access to land and to wealth and most importantly to status and to prestige. So it became in their interests to maintain the status quo, to please the foreign power, to keep their own people under control. I mean, this is a feature of imperial rule right through history, but the Romans were particularly good at it. Tacitus speaks frankly of, and these are his words, the old and long perceived principle of Roman policy which employs kings among the instruments of servitude. You use your Herods and you use your high priests in order to uh, exercise your control over, over your subject peoples. There are two kinds of administrative districts, just very, uh, very quickly, two kinds of administrative arrangements that existed in the empire. There were client kingdoms where the local kings ruled and paid tribute to Caesar. They were left to govern their own territories as long as they did so in a way that was consistent with Roman interests. And then there were provinces where a Roman governor was installed who was responsible for maintaining public order, for raising taxes, most important of all, and for exercising legal oversight. Again, both these forms of administration are relevant to the gospel story. Jesus came from Galilee in the north. Galilee was a client kingdom where the ruler was Herod Antipas, who was the son uh, of, uh, of Herod the Great. And the Herodian family was the ruling class of this, uh, of this client kingdom. Jesus' cousin, John the Baptist, was arrested by Herod even before Jesus began his public ministry. Mark chapter 1 verse 14, when it's introducing Jesus, says, After John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the, 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 the good news of God and saying. Mark tells of the execution of John the Baptist in chapter 6, but he mentions right at the beginning that uh, John had already been removed from the scene by Herod before Jesus began his public ministry. Herod was aware of Jesus' activity and was very fearful of him. Uh, he, for a long time, worried that Jesus was actually John the Baptist come back from the grave to haunt him. Uh, and he was very reluctant to get involved in suppressing Jesus. You remember the story in Luke's Gospel when Jesus is on trial before Pilate. He hears that Herod is in town for Passover. So he sends Jesus over to Herod for Herod to try and resolve the problem. But Herod is very, very reluctant to get involved because of what happened once he had literally uh, taken John's head off. 
Judea in the south was a Roman province. It was under the jurisdiction of a Roman governor who was based in Caesarea, whose name, of course, we all know, was Pontius Pilate. Pilate was the, was the governor of the province of Judea, but Jewish affairs within this province were administered by the Jewish Sanhedrin, which was a council of 70 persons, mainly priests, under the chairmanship of the high priest, and the high priest, of course, at the time of Jesus, was a man called Caiaphas. But Pilate was the one who maintained a watching brief, and it appears, the evidence is a wee bit ambiguous, but it appears that at the time of Jesus, the Roman governor reserved the right to exercise capital punishment. That the Jew, Jewish Sanhedrin could administer internal affairs except for cap, uh, dealing with capital crimes. Uh, John 18.31 refers to it, and so indeed does Josephus. But it does raise certain problems because we have episodes of mob justice uh, described in the book of Acts. But it's very important for understanding the trial of Jesus because... Uh, and we'll see this in a later lecture, when the Sanhedrin wanted to get rid of Jesus, they had to construe the charges against him in political terms so that Pilate would actually act and literally do the hatchet job on Jesus because they did not have the authority to execute Jesus himself. So they had to actually make sure that his, his crime was constructed in a way that it was in Pilate's interest to, uh, to order him executed. Pilate was a very nasty piece of work. Uh, he's actually a saint in parts of the church, uh, but he was a very nasty piece of work. Philo of Alexandria, a Jewish philosopher, about, uh, uh, roughly at the time of Jesus or the time of Paul, speaks of Pilate's term as governor as marked by, and these are his words, corruption, violence, depredations, ill treatment, offences, numerous illegal executions, and incessant unbearable cruelty. He was the Gaddafi of the first century. His ten years of rule of uh, the province of, of Syria, in which Judea was part from the year 26 to the year 36, uh, in that, that ten year period we know from our sources of at least seven incidents of extreme brutality that were perpetrated by Pilate. For example, in the year 26, Pilate attempted to introduce images of the emperor into Jerusalem, which was described by Josephus in two of his works. In protest of this, the Jewish population surrounded Pilate's palace in Caesarea for five days, kneeling as an act of nonviolent protest. Pilate threatened them with death, but the protesters simply bared their necks to the soldiers' drawn swords, crying that they would rather die than disobey God's rule. On that occasion, Pilate relented. But another occasion, when he seized part of the temple's sacred treasure, uh, treasure in order to build an aqueduct, the people of Jerusalem turned out again in nonviolent protest. Pilate ordered his troops to mingle with the crowds in Mufti with clubs under their cloaks, and then at a signal they drew their, drew their clubs and bludgeoned the demonstrators to death. Luke 13, 1, Jesus refers to an incident when Pilate mingled the blood of some Galileans with their sacrifices. We don't know exactly what that episode was, but it was clearly well known to Jesus' hearers. It was Pilate who ordered the flogging and crucifixion of Jesus after he was accused of treason by the Sanhedrin. Um, they went to Pilate saying that Jesus was claiming to be a rival king to Caesar and forbidding us to pay our taxes. And any Roman governor worth his salt had to be concerned about that. So the political setting of the Jesus story is extremely important, although in modern Christian piety we often glide right across the top of it and don't even notice. It's not a merely incidental detail in the background. Jesus' message about God's kingship, just think about it, God's kingship had radical political implications implications that cost him his life. Resentment towards Roman rule was very intense in the first century, and revolutionary movements led by messianic-type figures emerged frequently. N.T. Wright, one of the leading New Testament scholars of our day, says this, revolution of one sort or another was in the air and often present on the ground, both in Galilee and particularly in Jerusalem throughout the period of Roman rule. 
The Romans considered the Jews to be formidable opponents. They were populous in number, they were well organised, they were well financed, they were intensely motivated, and they were stubbornly independent. They were difficult to deal with, and they often were given special privileges simply in order to keep them happy. There was a widespread hope in this community that God would one day raise up a messianic deliverer who would throw off the Roman yoke and would restore Jewish independence. Let me read you something from the Psalms of Solomon, a Pharisaic work from the first century before the time of Jesus. And then let me read you something from the New Testament and listen to how similar they are. Here's from the Psalms of Solomon. See, Lord, raise up for them their king, the son of David, in a time which you know, O God, that he may reign over Israel your servant and gird him with strength to dash in pieces the unjust rulers. Who are the unjust rulers? The Romans, of course. When Jesus was born, according to Luke's Gospel, the priest Zechariah, who was the father of John the Baptist, prayed what in Anglican tradition is known as the Nunc Dimittis. And it goes like this, and try and hear this with first century ears. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, for he has visited his people. He has come to their rescue. He has raised up for us a power for salvation in the house of his servant David, even as he proclaimed by the mouth of his holy prophets from ancient times that he would save us from our enemies and from the hands of all who hate us. Thus he shows mercy to our ancestors and remembers his holy covenant, the oath he swore to our father Abraham, that he would grant us free from fear to be delivered from the hands of our enemies and to serve him in holiness and virtue in his presence all our days. You couldn't get something more political than that. That is an expression of messianic hope grounded in deliverance from our enemies and those who hate us, from the Romans. And Zechariah, when he sees infant Jesus, says, it has come. He's arrived. Our deliverer is here. The language of salvation in this text does not mean going to heaven when you die. Again, to quote Tom Wright, for first century Jews, it could only mean the inauguration of the age to come, liberation from Rome, the restoration of the temple, and free enjoyment of their own land. Now, in his own teaching and practice, Jesus had to address this revolutionary expectation, or else he would have been living on another planet. He had to address it. It was a live issue. It was in the air. Everybody else was conscious of it. One, again, one final comment, and then perhaps I'll stop. Roman imperial control was not only a political reality, it was also a cultural reality. The dominant culture of the time was Hellenistic culture, or Greco-Roman culture with its love of theatres and sports and gladiatorial games and circuses and baths and temples and philosophy. The dominant language was Greek. All civilised and educated people strove to master Greek. Greek was in the first century much like English is today. Everybody wants to either speak it or learn it. <coughs> Hellenistic language and Hellenistic culture were as attractive and as all-pervasive and as corrosive as is American culture and language in the world today. And even Palestinian Judaism was profoundly impacted by it, although more at a surface than at a deep theological level. Greek was widely spoken in Palestine alongside Hebrew and Aramaic and some Latin which explains why, according to John 19, when Jesus was crucified, Pilate also wrote a title and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. And you've got to get that with the right kind of sneer in it, some king. Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Many Jews, John says, read this title, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, in Latin and in Greek. It's not unlikely that Jesus himself understood 
and spoke Greek. He may have even given some of his teaching in Greek, although his first language was certainly Aramaic. But the Gospels and the entire New Testament is written in Greek. Even the letter to the Romans, to the church in Rome, is written in Greek. Even the epistle to the Hebrews, probably also to a community in Rome, but to a very Jewish community, is not written in Hebrew, it's written in Greek. Greek was the dominant language of the first century. Right, I'm going to stop, but I'll put these headings up and leave them for you to ponder, because if I was to really complete the picture, and again to be, to be true to the historical realities that we encounter in the Gospel, we also need to be aware of the socioeconomic context that Jesus' uh, society was characterised by. It's uh, described by sociologists as an advanced agrarian society. And the three things that if we had time that I would say about this society, which uh, again we find popping up in the Gospel accounts, are just these three observations. It was a society in which wealth was concentrated in very few hands. I mean, our society is becoming increasingly like that again, but it certainly was true of, uh, of society at the time of Jesus. There was a steep social, pyramidal social structure with the ruling classes that you could draw. If I had a whiteboard, you could draw. The, the, you know, the population was a pyramid one way and resources were a pyramid the other way. In other words, a tiny portion of the population controlled most of the resources, and most of the population controlled least of the resources. Goods and resources flowed from the bottom to the top. Uh, in Galilee, for example, the ruling class made up of the royal family and their, and their aristocratic clients owned between 50 and 75% of the land. So in the parables of Jesus, you constantly find this idea of absentee landlords. Uh, and, uh, and of things going on in peasant estates where, where peasants were losing control of their own land. A sharp distinction between rural and urban life. It's really interesting that Jesus seems to have avoided the big cities of his day. He was a kind of hippie because he went around the villages and the towns and he went to Jerusalem on a number of occasions but we're not told he went to any of the other big cities, although he probably did. But they certainly weren't the focus of his ministry. Uh, archaeologists have uncovered the city of Sepphoris, which was only a few miles from where Jesus lived and was one of the most important sort of uh, cities of its day. And Jesus, it's been suggested, probably went to theatre in Sepphoris uh, on occasion. It's only 10 kilometres from Nazareth. But um, we're not told anything of Jesus' encounter with, with big cities apart from Jerusalem, which was the Big Apple, of course. And then thirdly, it was a society which had a keen consciousness of status. This is something that modern scholars have emphasised and which I find myself thinking about a great deal because it's still true of us. We are still characterised in our society by what that British philosopher calls status anxiety. What people think about us is really important to us. And in this society, having status was more important than having wealth. And the way you got status was by conferring benefits on clients. And these clients therefore became sort of um, indebted to you. And so many of the encounters between Jesus and his critics have been characterised as sort of competitions for status. Uh, we haven't got time to put any details on that. but. Um, Patron-client relationships where patrons gain status by having lots of clients was a very important part of Jesus' world. Right, I want to honour our clock, so I'm going to stop now. And uh, next week we'll talk about Jesus' proclamation of the kingdom of God. Thank you. I think we will stop because um, it sets a good example for us for the weeks to come um, that we do finish on time and people know that this is the time that you can get away. Uh, I'm sure Chris would be happy to stick around for a couple of minutes if you did have some questions to come.
and ask him. But otherwise, uh, as Chris has said, we'll look forward next week, same time, same place, to uh, the proclamation of God's kingdom. And uh, I, I do urge you to be, I know parking is an issue, but be as punctual as you can so that we can get underway uh, nice and quick. That's, that's the Presbyterian plug. So thank you all for coming and have a good night. Thanks, Chris.